definitely welcome everybody. I definitely appreciate everybody and stuff being here in the room. So a little bit about myself. Let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, I'm a software engineer at heart. So I'm a problem solver at heart. I can kind of, you know, the beautiful thing of being a software engineer, you know, you can build anything you think of. The problem with being a software engineer, you can build anything you think of, you know, so it can be time consuming, you know, stuff as well. Um, kind of my, my, my journey started off where uh, my first idea, I had a big uh, sneaker platform. Um, this is like my first startup. So this is like some years ago. I was a big fan, big fan of Air Jordans, Nikes, LeBrons. And so I wanted a way where I can view my collection, other people's collection on my phone. And so at that time, it wasn't like any platform like that. So I started to kind of, you know, figure it out. Um, from there, I just kind of kept building, went to go work for startups, companies like Uber, uh, ad tech platforms like Treehouse, bigger ad tech platforms like Udacity, while well, I worked there too as well. And I'm, I'm doing that process too. I start to build, you know, kind of applications on the side. So there was an uh, Instagram comedian by the name of Haha ha Davis. He's an individual who kind of has his own like lingos, own sayings. He kind of used double words and stuff. It was a lot of time to describe things. It's all funny. And so me and my friends are always texting each other saying a lot of his sayings and lingo. We're like dying laughing because we understand what it means. So one day I'm just like, man, man, he should have his own, you know, iOS text messaging platform. I DM'd him, told him I had an idea and everything for him. And he said, hey, let's try it. See what you got. Interesting thing about, you know, that, especially as a software engineer, I had no clue what to do. But I knew I could figure it out and everything. So it took me about two months or so to build it. I did all the design of it, marketing, all this different stuff. And we launched it on a Sunday. And woke up that Thursday, something told me to check the app store, and it was number one app in the app store. Um, so from there, I was like, okay, this is, this is exciting. Um, during, along this journey too as well, um, after you'd asked that, I went to go work at a venture capital firm um, by the name of Lightshire Capital. Lightshire Capital is the largest uh, black-owned venture capital firm in the Midwest, uh, ran by a black woman. And so from there, um, the unique aspect of the venture capital firm it had a venture side, which would invest into companies, but it also had a nonprofit side where it would do a lot of uh, curriculum development for startups and for founders and things like this. So leadership came to me and said, hey, Marlon, you know, these grants are taking us quite some time. Can you help us figure something out? We just got access to OpenAI. Um, and so essentially what we ended up building was an AI grant writer. Um, and so... It was like kind of first, first of its kind, um, just over this time, I was talking to their engineering team a lot and they was kind of guiding me through the process and like, hey, this is very, very nice, unique and all these different things like that. The infrastructure of, of how it worked, uh, you would give it prompts and we give you responses, you know, based off like what the question that you're asking. These responses was all about and all focused around company data. The interesting thing about that, the outline that was very, very similar how ChatGPT um, is uh, aligned today, but that was three years ago. So <clears throat> in a component of education, I think this one is, for me, it kind of hit home. So I'm going a little bit deeper and stuff here. Um, single parent household. Um, mom had me at 14 years old. Um, pops and everything was incarcerated for quite some time and she was doing their process. Uh, some of the output of that is I'm an individual who left high school with a 1.7 GPA. Actually didn't graduate high school, got my GED. And during this time, you know, my focus was basketball and girls. What I didn't know is that that was my main focus because I didn't understand at that time how I wasn't being challenged. During that time process, I would look at the curriculum for the year, and if I knew I could do it, I'm, I'm checked out. Everything. And so a lot of times in education, we don't have the ability to do tailor-made uh, curriculums per student. It's very challenging. Typically, you have one teacher in the room with 25, 30 students. You know, it can be very, very challenging. And so, so with that, I always knew everything um, that I wanted a way where I can kind of like tailor-make some of these things to, for, like, for myself. So fast forward, you know, end up going to college. They sent my furs and went to start with Middle Georgia College and end up going to Ivory Murray University over there in, over there on, on the West Coast in Naples. They sent my first progress report home to my mom instead of giving it to me. My mom calls me yelling. 
yelling, cussing. I'm like, Mom, what are, you, what are you saying? What are you talking about? And everything. She finally comes down. She says, Marlon Avery, how do you have a 3.7 GPA in college? What happened? And everything. I said, well, you yeah. I want to play basketball and you know, stuff. I want to do more and stuff like that. Now I want to kind of challenge myself. What I didn't understand uh, at the time, I was started teaching, I started reteaching the math courses at school. It was, it was unintentional. So basically, when students and stuff would come, they would act, they were like, hey, this is not making sense and everything. And I would reteach myself and figure out kind of what their learning style was and how they need to receive the information. And I would teach each individual student and everything uh, how they can get these through, you know, certain math concepts. I didn't really know what I was doing at this stuff at that time, you know. So with that, <clears throat> this will be interesting for today. So before we kind of go a little bit further and stuff here, like I said, we've heard a lot of things, buzzwords, artificial intelligence, AI, maybe machine learning, deep fakes, all different things like that. You know, these can mean a lot of different things, but it also can have like some empty value you know, with it too as well. So with that, tell me some of your, of your concerns with artificial intelligence. What are some things and stuff that's kind of maybe worrying you a little bit? Job replacement. Good. What else? Security. Security. Elaborate. Sir? Elaborate. I mean, like, Mm -hmm. Cybercare is going to be a big one forever. Privacy, identity theft. Large language models. Yes. yes, yes. What else? I think so, before I go there, I think cybersecurity is probably one of the most interesting lanes for artificial intelligence, in my opinion, because we're seeing we haven't been able to figure this out now. The MGM just got they got just got held ransom for what fifteen million. I know we're, we haven't been able to figure this out now, you know. So also too. You know, tools like this is typically they don't have any good evil side of it. It's always human intention once you kind of put that tools in, you know, individuals' hands. I think they call it a hallucination where you have to be very reliable and uh, rely too much on it. Hallucination. Making up things with confidence. You may, you may ask you something simple, you know, as, as, you know, can you give me a biography on George Washington? And it adds a sentence in there that it got from somewhere else that has nothing to do with him. You know, or to completely just make up something to add in in there. Hallucination is definitely a problem. Probably be a problem for a while. False information. False information. Yeah, you have to validate your problem. You have to make sure that it's like, we're having Yep. Anything else? Access. Hmm, I like that one because it, it, it's interesting, too, because in my time of living, building, working, I don't think I've ever seen a technology be as open. You know, when somebody typically kind of gets their hands on the superpower, they kind of get close to the vest. Now we're seeing open source things, you know. Facebook, uh, they put out their, their model, Llama 2, and open sourced it for commercial use. I don't think we've, in my opinion, well, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this. So, with that, got a question for you. What innovation was blamed for a rise in crime, causing something called brain fever, and destroying civil society? Yeah, people from last week, you got to be quiet. <laughs> Internet? Good guess. I mean, that, that has caused a lot of, you know, 
rise in crime. I go, in, I go into a segment with brain fever me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we think a lot of we talk about misinformation. Um, that could have been TV too, right? That could have been TV. TV is another good guess. What else? Social media. Social media. Another good guess. It's a little bit older than that. Books. Books. It's a good guess. Newspaper. Any last guesses? The elevator. Was blamed for des destroying societies. Elevation of crime. Because now individuals have the ability to kind of get to, you know, level six a lot quicker for in and out access. Doctors called it brain fever, is at this time they didn't have a full understanding of basically what motion sickness was. For that time period, not too far off. But anytime innovation happens, typically us as human beings, we kind of start to get a little concerned. What is it going to do to us? It's a good example. Generative AI. Anybody can you give me the definition other than what's on the screen here or some examples of generative AI? Type of artificial intelligence that allows, I'm gonna say creative individuals instead of artists, capable of generating new unique outputs, you know, from stories, movie, movies, images, songs, books, ChatGPT is an example. You know, we got barred stuff now. Yes, it's a good example. It's a part of text. GitHub Copilot is a it's a uh, a software engineering coding assistant. You know, I use it a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> Fun fact for you too, as well. Um, there's a platform called GitHub which basically is a repository for, you know, for people to store code. 44% of all code on GitHub now has been AI generated. Speed. Has it, has it even been that long? Yeah, it's, I don't think it's been that long. I mean, ChatGPT came out in this November of last year. So, has anybody not heard of ChatGPT? Everybody's heard of it? Okay, beautiful. All right, so platforms like ChatGPT, BARD, um, what's Microsoft's? The, the browser? Yeah, Bing, Bing Chat, everything. Uh, platforms like this, these are all examples of large language models. And so large language models is basically is a large amount of text. And OpenAI has done a sensational job of figuring out a way how to scrape the entire internet, which means copy and paste every single website, you know, that has been in existence. As a software engineer, it's difficult sometimes to copy and paste one website. And they figure out a way how to do it for the entire internet. So what do you do with that? That's like the first step. This is called gathering a data set. This is kind of how you build a large language model. First step is gathering a data set. Second step is, is training the model, which means, okay, hey, now that I got this consortium of texts, this section of text is recipes. These were no books, movie transcripts, songs, you know, lyrics for you know, a different genre. These are called training the models. Third step on there is tuning the model. I'm gonna get a little bit more descriptive. This recipe is for sweet potato pie, 
typically feeds a party of five, um, and it has allergy, you know, friendly ingredients. We started kind of a little more descriptive and stuff then. So what can you do with that? I mean, this is where we're seeing like the examples right now of platforms like ChatGPT. Give me the ability to ask questions, prompts, you know, it gives you without the access to the internet as of right now, and with ChatGPT, BART has access to internet, uh, Microsoft Bing has access to the internet, but the big one right now, ChatGPT, you know, it gives you the ability to prompt it and kind of get responses on different things. Not only different responses, but some form of creativity as well. Everything changed 2017. There's a research paper called Attention is All You Need, which basically is saying this is an invention of the transformer. The transformer and stuff like on there, typically how we was how things with stuff would be in uh, work is called RNN. Uh, I think it's like uh, something newer network. I can't think what R stands for. But basically, how everything worked and stuff then before is when you gave you know an aspect the AI something to read, it would read it line by line like we do, which is fine. But now we're talking about speed that can slow things down. Now with transformers and stuff, what it does and stuff in there, it assigns you, paragraph one, you, paragraph two, three, four, and seven. And then from there, y'all come together and discuss what you've read, and then now it has a summary of understanding of what it read all together. That's a lot quicker from going line to line to line to line. This is why I can kind of spit out so much data, you know, or responses you know, fairly quickly from anything from, hey, I want to want you create a workout plan for me, recipes, books, curriculums, you know. So with that being said, you know, <clears throat> how impactful can this be? I got some examples and stuff here of impactful times. The Industrial Re Revolution, you know, I, I would argue that was an impactful time for our, uh, our world and stuff here. The Industrial Revolution, when it comes to impact, monetary impact, uh, that time period added 0.7% increase of GDP per year. The Green Revolution, a.k.a. the farming era. We saw this and everything, a lot of impact and stuff there in 1940s, 1970s. This added 0.3% increase monetary value of GDP per year. And the one we're living in today is the internet revolution. What we're saying is going to be is adding 0.6% GDP year to year. So how does that compare to what we're about to see? McKinsey and company did in a paper a couple weeks ago and they said that uh, generative AI, the economic impact of such will add 2.6 to 4.4 trillion dollars to the economy over the next coming years. They broke it up in four categories. They said 75% of that is going to fall in four, four categories. First category being custom operations. You know, so we're seeing things like, you know, so, you know, uh, customer self-serving chatbots. Agent interactions. This is a big one what we're going to talk about today. Agent self-improvement along with that too as well. Marketing and sales. I want you to act as, you know, a marketer and help me write this email, this ebook, this sales strategy. Software engineer, he mentioned get uh, copilot. You know, we're seeing it, we're seeing it already. You know, the impact and stuff of such. And then research R and D, research and development. The more I dive into this daily. And as brilliant as this, these individuals are, this company, I'm also thinking this is grossly under, underestimated. What this doesn't take an account of is the individual, the creativity of the individual, because typically, you near know, thing, how, going back to this one, typically, how impact and technology used to go especially on the first two, it used to go government, 
typically got access first, big businesses, small businesses, and then individuals. The internet kind of flipped that. Now we're seeing the big indiv individuals getting access to this first. I mean, this is what the consumer facing product is with ChatGPT. This also didn't where AI didn't start, but now we're seeing the impact of such when you put it in the individual's hand. Small businesses now are starting to come around, figure out ways how to adopt this. Large businesses so on to as well. Now governments are last. Things kind of flipped. With this article, what McKenzie did, this is all around businesses. And they're saying this is going to be 4.4 trillion. This doesn't take into account for the individual. Governments. I'll be interested to see how much of a small business is a percentage of this. By the way, this is a 14% increase in the GDP that we're going to see. No, and, and you know, total and stuff overall. I think the on the last one, the biggest increase I believe was the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, it was like the Industrial Revolution. I think I added up. It was like thirteen percent total increase, and we're saying that artificial intelligence is going to be bigger than that. What is also I just kind of kind of hit me. This doesn't really talk about the creative, the artists. We can include that with movies, film directing, music, art, you know, beautifully broken down, but I, I'm starting to think, you know, it's maybe a little bit underestimated. I would challenge that. I like it though. I would challenge it. We saw this with um, what's the music company that started off? Napster. Napster. We saw this with Napster. Their process started. And everything where basically it showed that the consumer wanted free music or crooked access, you know, to music. You know, um, innovation is always going to happen. This laid the foundation for Spotify to come in, Apple Music. You know, you can even argue Netflix, you know, in a way. Innovation is always going to happen and stuff with that. Even with a game changing principle of people are showing, like, hey, the Drake AI song and everything, we like user generated music. But that also still had to live somewhere. YouTube. Maybe you put it back on Apple Music. Look at it like this. We have these large language models. We get to the point where people are looking at it and posting it on themselves. Right. At some point, this becomes the host for. Google's working on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure, it's like it's maybe one time, maybe, or maybe it's small. But that breaks down lots of different things that used to cost. Was you here last week? I talked about that a little bit last week. I believe, in my opinion, and everything, since the internet has flipped, you know, everything with everything, like I said, when it comes, it comes to innovation, typically before it was government, big businesses, small businesses, and then individuals, the internet has kind of flipped it. 
You know, I think also, too, that would be flipped to as well when we come to things like large language model, because now it gives the creative access to kind of become their own entity. You know, we're seeing this, you know, this, this may be not, you know, be, may not be consumer friendly, but we're seeing this in lanes like OnlyFans. But I also believe that those individuals would also become their own business. They become their own brand. I don't think it's going to be live as like a one person organization for quite some time. It's going to need help in certain different ways. But it kind of goes back because now you have to hire people. Adding back to the GDP. Yeah. I mean, think about the, uh, and, and this is okay. Think about the independent artists today. You know, the independent artists and everything still has to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, um, rapper, Google rapper. Toby's one of my favorite artists. Toby New, Toby New Wickway, independent artist. You know, Prince told us a long time ago, you need to start owning your masters, you know. But that, even that, from that standpoint, his creative work that he produces still has to live somewhere. I mean, he can, you know, figure out ways to have to do it himself and everything. But, you know, that's where innovation happens. You're still going to have the big businesses are not going to go away. They're going to figure out the way their piece to get, you know, get to that. But even with that, Toby has figured out a way how also to employ people. Todd Perry. Creative. Creative. Last week I talked about how the insertion of difficulty of getting started or creating your own large language model, you know, having your own representation of your AI, that difficulty level, what it was before, it's coming down very, 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 very quickly. You know, so now we're at a place where I'll show you some examples here in a second, in a second, how you can start using these things, you know, starting today. So <clears throat> this whole series is based around like, you know, AI has become the ultimate assistant, you know, in every aspect in our lives. You know, so like I said, last week we talked about education. I'm sorry, last week we talked about founders. This week we're gonna talk about education and so on and so on. But I also believe we're, we're all gonna have an assistant where it's gonna be an assistant to helping you find your next doctor. Food selections. You know, we're already starting to see that already with our you know it. Gmail has become our assistant. Auto completion. Tesla. Driving assistant. Flying. You know, fl uh, flight attendants have, you know, their flying assistant. 90% of the time they said they're not flying. Like manually, you know, you know, flying. So, <clears throat> what makes all this different than typically is something that we've known and stuff before? You know, what makes these large language models different? You know, in my opinion, the biggest, the main three things that makes these difference is the ability to make it your own in some type of way. In three ways. Systems, user, and assistant. So system is like an example of like the chat GPTs. You know, so in that system, you can give an instruct instructions, you know, an, an objective, you know, a goal that you're trying to get to. User is us. Now with us, we can all talk about large language models, but every individual is gonna have their own unique perspective, which also can produce unique results. And then an assistant. I like to call it the act as. I want you to act as, you know, an influencer 
for social media and help me create a social media strategy to, for dog lovers. I want you to act as, you know, a principal and help me create an outline to engage with my teachers, you know, more effectively around food policy. This is kind of what make everything so different. Remember these three things, I'm gonna show you this example and stuff here in a second. So, why artificial intelligence for educators? Like what's the main, what's the benefits and stuff here? My personal opinion, the main three benefits you have is personal learning, enhancing efficiency and engagement, and then curriculum development is the biggest one. They kind of blend together and stuff. Every student now will have the unique ability to have an AI to some capacity adapt to them and their learning style. An assistant. China's already doing this. Educators will often find themselves, you know, you find yourself doing tasks and stuff like you mentioned before. Now we have the ability to automate a lot of these things. I talked about before how now I built my own email AI system. When I get an email and stuff in now, it copies it, reads it, gets an understanding of it. It sends me a draft of response and I just, yes or no, if I want to send it off. Task. And the curriculum development. I'm gonna show an example of stuff here. Stuff here in a second. With all this though, all of this is gonna be hit to a place, going back to what he said stuff earlier, is we're all gonna have a decision to make as we move forward. Buy it or build it. Buy it means using somebody else's tool, ChatGPT, Mid Journey, Dolly 3 now, Stable Diffusion, you know, all these generative AI uh, consumer facing products. You know, these are all like aspects of buying it, using somebody else's to kind of get a, uh, get our problem solved, solution done. Or then sometimes it makes sense to afford to build it. Maybe some of your concerns and stuff you don't want to have to go to ChatGPT every single day, you know, to implement some of these things. Actually, hold on. Oh, there we go. Um, so maybe we want to go to ChatGPT to implement some of these things. When we're talking about building it, you know, these are some should be some of our main focuses. We should be thinking about you know, how accurate can we get it? You know, there's, in, there's a lot of ways right now where you can use a lot of like no code platforms to kind of, kind of help you get certain solutions done. Um, but when you kind of start thinking about things of accuracy, especially with the large scale for, you know, a big institution, you might want to kind of build it yourself. We got to think about error rate. You know, we got to think about uh, consumer satisfaction. Training time of the large language model and cost. We still haven't figured that out yet. These big large language models at some capacity use a thing called GPUs. They're very expensive right now, especially the best ones. One GPU, like an A100, is going to range you 10,000, 15,000 for one. It's rumored that uh, OpenAI their GPT-4, they haven't said it publicly, but it's rumored that they use about a thousand A100s and it took about two months for it to train it, for GPT-4. It's rumored. I know a buddy who works there. I, I'm not saying that he told me or she told me. Um, call savings, turnaround time. These are some of the things we gotta think about when we're talking about building our own. So, 
for implementation when it comes to, actually, let's do this first. We'll jump into some examples and stuff here. Right. Okay. So I got a few prompts and stuff here. Okay. So this one, so, you know, most everybody in the room has already said that they understand, um, you know, what ChatGPT is. So for people watching online, uh, ChatGPT is just simply a large language model. So it gives you the ability to give it a prompt, question, objective, you know, statement, and it does a thing called like basically probability, almost guessing your, what your next word may, may be. Um, and then from there, it can kind of give you some very, very creative responses and, and such. So with this prompt and stuff here, I have, big enough. So I want you to act as, um, this is like the assistant, you know, that we talked about before. I want you to act as an AI writing tutor. tutor. I will provide you with a student who needs help improving their writing and tasks um, to use artificial intelligence tools, such as natural language processing, to give the student feedback on how they can improve their composition. Um, you say you should also use your theoretical knowledge and experience about effective writing skills in order to suggest ways that a student can ex better express their thoughts, ideas, and writing form. Uh, my first request is I need help to help edit my master thesis. Instead of doing that, because I don't want to copy and paste all of that, let's do... Um, let's go with my article. Okay, so let's do... We'll do this. I'm going to take one of my articles and stuff I've written. Also, too, all these images have been uh, AI generated, including us. That's my favorite. So let's go. All right. I talked about it in this article. I think I talked about prompt engineering and stuff, what it is. So look at this. It says your article is well structured, informative. Here are some suggestions to help improve its clarity, flow, and engagement. Introduction. Try to immediately capture your reader's attention with questions or, you know, proactive statements. Give a better understanding with prompt, prompt engineering, tips for designing prompts, more examples, prompt engineering in action, the power of such, tools of the trade, conclusion, thoughts, huh? What's that? <laughs> Thoughts, though. I just gave it a few lines, and then I gave some of my data, things that I've written, and I basically I asked it to, hey, I want you to analyze this. Pretty good. One of the things is, too, as individual was training and building large language models, it knew it would get an understanding of text. You know, it would get an understanding of that in your sense. So basically, how the computer machine learning process works and everything, it gets words and it, it understands words as numbers. So the word between may be, you know, number 366 in, the, in its own dictionary. So it has a mathematical understanding of how to put sentences together. The one thing that was very, very surprising to a lot of us is that we didn't think it was going to understand the principles of writing. That was new. 
Because now we get the, we start to kind of get principles, understand you can do a lot of different things up there. Because now principles of a thesis and principles of an ebook is two totally different things. Writing a principle for a recipe and writing principles for a songs is two totally different things. Principles. Yeah. Bullet so that you didn't put it in the that you used for this, but I'm assuming that previously you trained Chat GPT to respond like this? No. I, I, to be honest, I don't have no clue what it's going to say every single time. It's going to give you a different response. So her, her question is, is, did I do like some pre-training, you know, to it? to kind of get to respond this way? And the answer is no. This is the power of large language models. It's going to give you a, a new response, a different response of every single time. Also, too, her question also is what prompting, or they gave it, she's like, give it a good prompt, is how to write good prompts is typically three to four steps is give it a context. You know, questions, commands, statements. Um, you know, be clear. Like he just said, experiment. Try different ways. And the big one, my favorite one, is a sign of the role. Uh, that, that little thing right there is going to change everything. Number four. So watch this. Good question. His question is, were there any concerns uh, doing, do, uh, using proprietary information? Absolutely. Yeah, so you can best believe in everything. There's an option now where you can turn off history, where basically now uh, OpenAI has said, if you turn off history, they won't use your data to you know, help train their models and everything. But if, you, if, you don't, if you're not thinking about that and you're putting something like your social and everything, it could get gathered up in there, in there and for sure. So yeah, it's also too why big companies are now they're deciding right now if they're going to build their own or they're going to use like the enterprise version of this. An example is like Pinterest. Their engineering team, their stuff, they finally decided they're going to use the enterprise version of this instead of building their own. But now you see companies like Google, um, not Microsoft, well, Google saying, hey, we're going to build our own versions, buy versus build. So a lot of companies, individuals do have those concerns. Some more are saying like, hey, you know, we can trust these individuals. Let's just go with it. Someone's like, mm, no, I'm just going to, you know, use this and stuff um, in a different sector. But yes, there, there are definitely concerns. So how can it become helpful? So right here in settings. Chat history and training, you just toggle this off. So, so, 
it's in your know, your payment is made and it's not paid. You find out later on that so I think it's okay and then we yeah we can take the precautions but does it really mean that it's every individual's decision and company and organization stuff for sure. As a builder, as like me, I, I I'm not too concerned. You know, um, I'm, there's aspects of me giving my data where it can make it better for everybody, and I understand that. But it's aspects where it can, you know, kind of harness some of my creativity, and I can be more careful with that for stuff for sure. Um, but like we just said, like her example, like we've seen this, this is happening already. We've seen this, you know, with Facebook, you know, we've seen this and everything with large companies like Twitter and such, you know, so, you know, they've definitely used our data in a lot of ways, but there's also been a lot of benefits to such as well. It's always just not negative. You know, it's given this ability to communicate with family, friends across the nation, across the world, you know, with such type of tool, but it also has taken advantage and stuff in some ways too as well. So, you know, definitely, like I said, definitely think about, you know, the information that you're putting it in, um, you know, per prompt, you know, per chat, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but also don't let that stop you. You know, be, have concern, you know, acknowledge your yellow lights, your red lights and everything. But just like the elevator, this is moving forward with or without this, you know. And so I definitely, and this is why I enjoy doing these workshops and everything because my whole goal is to show you, you know, the ability of such tools and, you know, where it, where it is going to go and how it can be used, mostly on the good side and so for me because I just enjoy the building aspect of it. Um, but it also too, like, encourage you to find a way. So take, take your yellow lights, take your concerns, build with it, you know, write your emails, your concerns, you know, policy makers, you know, the Europe Act and stuff is coming here soon. You know, stuff like that, but don't let don't let it be a red light, though. You know, because we may need those concerns that you're thinking about, um, you know, to help us, you know, create a better AI centric world that they're moving towards. So um, there's a company called Adrian Horowitz. They put together that basically they said, you know, don't don't let this be a worm for you. This is basically a system structure of how like uh, something like a large language models architecture is kind of happening behind the scenes. What I mentioned along stuff with, with number four of, you know, allowing this to be, you know, like your assistant is this area right here, in my personal belief, is just simply going to change everything. Because this right here can be adapted to so many different areas. I mean, we're, I'm going to show you some examples here in a second where, you know, an entire institution, you know, can build their own AI system and everything and allow their students to just log in. The teachers will upload their curriculum, their data, um, and they have the ability to take it home with them and it can help them learn. So going back here, that's one prompt example. It says the role and stuff that is being assigned here. So you are a quiz creator. Um, you will look up and how to develop low state tests and diagnosis, diagnostics. You will construct several multiple choice questions to quiz the audience on the topic of the page. Uh, the questions should be highly relevant and go beyond just facts. Multiple choice questions should include plausible, competitive, alternate, uh, alternative solutions and should not include all the above options. Um, at the quiz, at the end of the quiz, you provide an answer to key uh, and explain the right answer. Give me a subject. A class. I mean, on grade. What did she say? History. For what grade?
of course, this is a large language model, so we have to double check, you know, some of these things. One of the beautiful things is of like these tools and stuff do now is they remove the blank page syndrome. As you're sitting there for 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes, whatever, think about where to get started or how should you align this, whatever, you can just kind of like, you know, start giving the prompts and stuff here. This could spark another idea, which sparks another idea, which sparks another idea, then boom, now you got it. Huh? Well, I'm not, I don't understand what you mean by words. Elaborate. Remember, I can't, I can't hear you really well. But you said, you said it could be worse. Wasn't that the definition of the internet? I mean, this, it, you know, we've already been doing this with the internet. Again, there's pros and cons to such. I would hope everybody the stuff that drove here didn't print out MapQuest to get here. Can I? Yes, ma'am. Can I add the devil's advocate here? Yeah. I will. Uh, um, the teachers already know how to do the equipment. And by the way, they just regurgitate the same quiz because the curriculum hasn't changed. Right? Mm. Well, my concern is how do we, kids are checking out from this. Okay? How do we, I think it's more interesting the, the, the part where the teacher, where they find a way to give kids the information in a more concise and interesting way. And that is the human intelligence part of it. So maybe it's a combination of those two things, but they built a load of, of different types of these tests, quizzes every day, every moment, and just kids are checking out. So. Okay, so watch this. It's a more interesting, more interesting thing for, I think, the more interesting way is to figure out how to engage folks with this curriculum, not the quiz, because they're getting quiz otherwise you know right now. Okay, so watch this. Come here real quick. Come here. Come here. You call me? Yep. <laughs> Since it is a large language model, it understands kind of Structure. There's a structure called JSON, which is a, a text structure where it can understand like multiple things. It kind of takes everything in doses and almost like a brain. Everything. I found this out a couple years ago when I was chatting to my maybe not friend that, that could be a he or a she person. And they told me that, you know, hey, do you do understand that this understands JSON too as well? And I was like, okay, this is interesting. What's up? Huh? So, this is an AI tutor. Mm -hmm. So we just show like one like basic example of stuff here. What this is going to do is going to give it any subject, actually for your son, mm -hmm. any subject. Let's, let's go with his hardest subject. His hard, hardest subject is what? Uh, let's say marine. Marine science. Okay, marine science. Yeah. Beautiful. Right there. Okay, so we're going to do marine science, and I want you to read through this. What's his, out of these, his learning style? Where is it? Mm -hmm. Oh, there and we let's go. Let's see the kid is on the autism spectrum. I will, yep, we're going to add that into as well. Yeah. His learning style, other than visual, because I got to do some more additional stuff there. What's his learning style? Um, visual. What's other than visual? Um, 
intuitive. Okay. So we intuitive. Which one? Deductive and intuitive. Okay. So we'll pick pick one, and then I want oh, you to go to one. yeah communication style. And you can scroll down. Storytelling. Okay. Scroll down to the tone tone style. Um, actually, yeah, let's we'll see what happens. And then reason and framework. I would say I'm illogical. Okay. All right. So let's scroll down. All the way down. And in the chat here, I said to say, can you help me learn? Go ahead. I got it. Can you help me learn? You said marine something. Can you help me learn? Um, says, my son is how old? Or put his grade level, his age or grade level, either one. Okay. You say he's also on the autism spectrum? spectrum? Mm -hmm. Let's put that into as well. Okay. okay. Now let's just do. Can you explain it like a fifth grader? We'll get to that. Put in, we say his learning style was. You can, you can just type in learning style in like dash or whatever it may be. Well, other than visual, I, I gotta do some additional stuff there. What was the other thing? Uh, you can scroll back up. I'm gonna add it as you teach mm Comma. comma, and then communication style, scroll down, I think you said storytelling. Yeah. You comma again, tone style, Reasoning framework. Okay. Okay, so we got, can you help me learn? Marine science, my son is 11th grader on the autism spectrum. His learning style is reflective, communication style is storytelling, um, tone, informative, uh, reason and framework, and logical. All right, let's hit enter. And then scroll down.
uh, just say, say, sounds good, let's get started. You scroll up back to like where it started, like on, on this section. Yeah, right here. So we got a story. In a world not too far from us, from ours, but hidden beneath the waves, lies vast the kingdom. This kingdom isn't like those in fairy tales and castles and dragons. Instead, it's a realm where the castles are made of coral and dragons are seahorses. Welcome to the world of marine science. Thoughts? Adaptable? Of learning style? Reason and framework? All in storytelling mode? Thoughts? Of, Thank you. Um, like tap into a different dimension and factor of learning, and that's what I like. That now teachers can introduce a whole new um, way of thinking and processing with using AI from a prompt perspective versus oh the kids aren't going to be thinking and so on and so forth. Um, so I see them being involved in that way and enjoying. The output and have the phone with it. Sounds like a sounds like a potential new job position. <laughs> what else? Individualize the world. Someone on the autism spectrum has a different learning style than someone who has a different public characteristic. Absolutely. Because you may never think 
I'm doing it this way, why is I'm doing it this way, this is my job. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the problem with the, the way that if you're using it and just creating tests, you know, you have to, when you, when you come into the classroom, you have no to Python. Hmm? No Python. Oh, the Milton Daniel guy, teacher. With the way you are excited about this, with, and that's where the human intelligence and this profiling are going to create vast amounts of interest in any student. By the way, you want to be like, oh, you know, okay. Assistant. <laughs> okay. And that's what I'm talking about. Because when you read it in a row, not to talk about the this one, it's the same thing as if you're reading it long form. You have to, teachers have to come in. And that is what's going to not get rid of your job. The human intelligence, the human component, the human passion. Interaction. The, the way that you're going to express it for each science it isn't just about the deep blue sea and the creatures that inside it. It's about understanding how our first work systems work together. And, and if I'm doing this, I'm making sure that I have the visuals or we're going to create that together so they understand what it is that we're doing. And that's how you get a marine biologist and a computer scientist and a, and a data specialist is through this coming in now with, you can't, you can't teach like this anymore. That's my point. <laughs> Watch this. Hold on. So watch this. I like that. I'm going to use, watch this. I'm going to use this. I like that. We're at a place now where artificial intelligence, the sense of like human beings is starting to adapt, meaning vision. You know, we see. AI is getting a place where it can see. It's called computer vision. You know, um, speaking. We're at a place where now AI can speak and everything. Going back to when I said why assigning it is a role is going to change everything because now we're at a place where I can use her personality, tone, sentiment, sentiment yeah, sentiment analysis, everything, tone, all of that, and now use her as the at home AI tutoring assistant. Voice. Going, going, back to, going back to the conversation between him and I, now we're going back to the, the enterprise versus the individual because now this becomes a business for her. Somebody's given her access to a large language model where now she can kind of create different subjects and maybe she's always just given permission to use her voice. Very much so. It's not voice, it's not video, it's not it's just level one. And that's in chat GBT's situation. Now all these language models are popping up that you can own and train in house. You don't have to pay anybody for it, you just you can train to do the same thing. Um, combine that with things like the companies called Little Labs, who will really the first when it comes to uh, really good voice transfer. I'll actually replace myself. Some PowerPoint presentations that I give, it's, I'm not actually talking, I'm going to talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds like it's talking, it's not talking. All right? Combine that with that. Now you replace yourself, you're actually talking, you're giving a class globally with this. You can do this actually right now. You can do this. You can do this. The whole call you said, you know, it takes a level of expertise. Right? Mm -hmm. There's also a video. Video is still looking like Right? We're two years away from video being smooth enough to not off, throw people off when they need to make that personal connection. But in two years, you combine that, the text, you combine the sound, you combine the video, and now you have you sort of with a slight mustache. Let me add to it. Watch this. Watch this. 
my son is an A student, by the way, because of that. Let me, let me add to exactly what he said and, and put it in a wrapper and stuff here. Now you have you per student in their own YouTube playlist to learn. This changes everything. By the way, he said, so like what I showed before was like just kind of giving it a prompt, a simple prompt and showing, you know, what it can do and give you a response. So, you know, it's multiple prompts and that can be done that this is like kind of like an advanced one. Like he said, I'm a software engineer. Let's go a different level. So this is some code. Don't be alarmed. Um, yes, I know the API key is there. Don't kill me. Um, so what happens? When they're the same example of getting it to be adapted to every student. You have a classroom full of 20. The teacher has to create a curriculum every year. Typically, sometimes, like, like you said, it may just kind of copy and paste from last year. But this whole process just hasn't changed in you know, decades. Yeah. Huh? Uh, well, we're in the state of Florida. We're not going to talk about this. <laughs> this. Actually, come here. So I written this, and I've said, like, hey, you know, I said, hey, there is a Level one, two, start egg. There's learning styles here. You can say it. same thing, communication styles, tone styles, reasoning framework. Watch this. Going back to the role, I said, it says, hey, you are an expert learning strategist in building curriculum for all students. Based on student data, I would like you to create a 10 week curriculum along with homework assignments, quizzes, um, to make sure the students learn effectively. Uh, uh -uh. Again, you can have a seat. All right, so let's scroll down. Watch this. So here we got the student's name, learning style. Actually, before you do that, pick a subject. Come down here. Yeah, you can type in a subject. Okay, now let's go communication. All right, hit uh, submit data, and then add another student. Change it up, yeah, change it. Right. Hit submit data. Let's add one more. Submit data. And then double click process data. Okay, give it a second. So, just like we did in the prompt and stuff there, the only different stuff here, I built this out as a software engineer. I've asked open AI, I'm gonna say, hey, let me get access to your API. It's gonna take a second. So you're gonna get access to the API, and what I want you to do is, I want you to follow these instructions per student. 
Scroll over down. It's still going. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So not yet. So it has Jameson's curriculum. Put it in, just like in a Word doc. Now it's going on. Who's that? Matt doing Matt's next. Again, I, I have no clue what it's gonna say. Though, again, this is a new way. It's not perfect, experimental, but you see the gist of it. How this can change everything. Questions while we're waiting. I think what we just speaking from like a, I guess a software standpoint, and she was uh, pointing out about like how it's being presented to students. In my mind, I was thinking it's like it's just the client. Like right. Once we have the data, getting the data. Right. We can present anything we want. Right. 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 So, uh, Visual, vocal. Yeah. yeah it's, you know, we. Can, I mean, we're talking about now. I can integrate a platform like Midjourney, and say, hey, instead of curriculum per student, create me a comic book. And teach them a subject. Dali. Hmm? Dali three. Dali three. Yep. All right. So we're waiting on John. There we go. All right. So folders over there on the left, left panel. Up top. Down. Down. Right. Right there. Click that. All right. Download with Jameson. Can you respond to downloads? Yeah, just uh, uh, download Matt. And then John. All right. So let's go ahead and open it up. We got two of Jamison's, or is that? Yeah. Okay, so we got Jamison. What what grade did you put? Uh, this one, I think it's eighth grade. Eighth grade. Okay. Good. User curriculum. Gets it kind of to align per student. The learning style, communication style. Kind of gives you kind of like a. It's called an outline stuff here. Scroll up real quick. Where where's the quizzes? Uh, at the Eagle Wing quiz and everything. Okay, so this is the kind of like a general standpoint. We can get more detail. Like I said, this is just the prompt and stuff that I gave it. But you, uh, you get an understanding of, go to John or Matt. Matt's a little different. Is that Matt or John? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Scroll down. I wish I was doing clearance. Nice little curriculum. Eighth grade math, correct? Six. Six, eighth, eighth, sixth grade math. And then let's go to the last one. Yeah. Eighth grade, yeah. So again, the ability to adapt per student is where we're headed. It'd be homework assignments, reading material, comic books, learning engagements, quizzes. Now the only thing the teacher has to do is just simply prompt it is where we're headed. Again, China's already doing this. Absolutely. You side by side.
Mm -mm. Don't, do, don't do full screen. Oh, okay. You're going to do half, half. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what some of the stuff means. It's been so long. So is this Jameson's? Uh, yeah, right Jamie's. Yeah. Wait, well, yeah, well, other, other way. Yeah, Jamie's is on the left, John's on the right, yeah. On the level four, right, because we all have different ways of yeah, mm -hmm. understanding. Here's the problem. We have to take into consideration that the teacher goes with the teaching guide, and that's it. You said it, he, say it again? The teacher goes with the pacing guide, which means that you have within the first week you have this one particular thing, then you have another particular thing, week three to four, week five to six is another thing, right? So you see mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 issue is how we do it within the teaching guide, structure things in such a way that the kids can keep up because if you miss what I mean one to two, week one or two, and then you the teacher has to go to the teaching guide. You have students who come back in time. You have to find a way to be able to teach those two things. Mm -mm. Watch this. Do you change the teacher or do you change the prompt? Do you change the prompt? That's the question. Do you change the teacher or do you change the prompt? <laughs> but in this example, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great observation. And everything. It's saying, right, what you're saying, this, is, this doesn't align up for the teacher. Change the prompt. It's adaptable. I mean, this is just a, an example that we put out, you know, you know, in a couple minutes. I'm thinking ahead of, because sometimes you have the technology, but then you have what you call the human being that has to learn things. Yeah, yeah. Copy this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go back to the code base. Two, which goes into three, four, I did change there. Uh, right. Uh, go back a Right there. Change that. Change that line. That con that context line. So. Yeah. So. Yes and no. You're basically saying that this curriculum stuff it doesn't align, correct? And it can kind of be off pace per student. Especially math is very difficult. Per math, yeah. What I'm saying is, is you're right. This is a problem stuff that we can have in today. Some students, some students kind of check out. So do you? But the problem doesn't align, you know, with the software and stuff. You just change the prompt. You can then be more, you know. Uh, direct and say, hey, I want the students to all learn week one, this subject, in their learning styles, week two, this subject, in their learning styles, week three, and so on and so on. Again, it's an assistant. Now, you, like I said, now this gives the ability to have the teacher to have eight arms. Because she, be, she might be teaching one thing, you know, and stuff like during the day and assigning, assigning 27 different homework assignments, you know, through the night. By the way, also, too, we're at a place right now, uh, Harvard CS50 uh, introduced this some years ago, where AI can do automatic grade, uh, uh, grade, um, what's, the, what's the word? It, it can grade your paper, so grade your homework assignment. So you just hit submit, and the teachers just review it. Did you copy it? Yeah. Okay. Copy. All right. You run it? Did you run it? No, no, no. We gotta run it again. Here, do do run time. Hmm? Uh, uh, I'll talk. Run time. Run all. So now we change this prompt to says you are an expert learning strategist, building comic books for all students. Now we go from curriculum, and I'm gonna try comic books. This is also without images. This should be the text and stuff of it. 
All right, Iran. Now you put in a student. Subject. Do history or something like that, something different. Not a student. It, you know, it'll compile at the end. Yeah. What does this look like 10 years out? Huh? What does this look like 10 years out? This I, I, can, I'm, I don't know. It's hard to tell you what this is at 10 months out. I can tell you this is, yeah, 10 years out, this is the uh, different, it's a different world. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'll say, I'm not, I'm not going to put a, I'm not going to put a date to it, um, but I would say, like again, every in the space of education, every student or should have their own homework teaching assistant for every subject. For well, I'm sorry, one assistant for all subjects. I mean, we haven't solved. We haven't. We've never solved that problem. We're still a teacher teacher uh, shortage. Mm-hmm. Did you process? Okay. Plausible. Mm -hmm. You say it doesn't transfer over to the classroom? The reason, the reason I'm gonna say, the reason I'm gonna challenge that, um, but right, I'm trying to, you know, we're in overtime. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm gonna challenge that is your concern is a lot of people's concern in the reverse way, meaning, like you're basically saying that I see a line where this is simply just gonna replace the teacher. Is that fair to say? I think. I challenge that is because the biggest thing of human beings, of what we need, yarn for, is human inter interaction. We still need that, you know, in so many different ways. There's places and areas where we don't. We're seeing this at, we've seen this as an example, like with Domino's Pizza. Domino's is, test, is testing self driving cars to deliver your pizzas. That's not a big area of human interaction. But teachers, I definitely see that this will stay around for quite some time. Okay. We have people, uh, obviously, it's none of us in here, right? For lots of reasons. You have people who are having relationships with the African companions. Very so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're getting their feedback and their self worth and everything from their generation. You can say, hey, this is actually going to be taking over. Put it, put it uh, all together. Um, right. You're right. I'm going to challenge it again 
And I'm going to say, as a parent, a couple of years, my mom. <laughs> The parents are still the customer. Does the parent want their child at home for eight hours a day? Right. Eight a. Right. Uh huh. Were you challenging the teaching or the learning? Because it, it's one or the other. It, it can't be I was challenging the fact that yes, grades be individualized maybe the parents would have to do the individualized because when you're in the classroom, you have a guiding tape, and that guiding tape says in the first two weeks, you do integers, let's say. The second week, you do, and, and they do it, no matter if you understand it, and if she doesn't understand it, you're going to still keep moving on. Go back to the code base. Go back to, you know, go back to the code base. You must follow the child is right there. My child is the focus, so I do an individual essay. And to his point, uh, if you do the Florida, um, you know, homeschooling, yeah, I think it's it's wonderful. But for me, the human component, which is what he talked about, is very important for for, for my child. I think for all children, mm -hmm. to go out into the world, and yeah. that's the only reason he's in the classroom. So this structure of okay how we how we educate them is very important because teachers have to in order to secure their jobs let's put it this way plain and simple they would have to be able to work they have to work with ai they have to work with mm -hmm. the parents parent engagement and parents have to take more responsibility for how they educate their children it's the same old way but a new way both and Exactly. I think it's both and. I, I think it's I think it's both. To his point, I, my daughter does virtual and mm -hmm. it is more so right now they're teaching us the way they teach us. Mm -hmm. However, I'm into this because of the way my daughter can learn. Both so and because right here, they're like, Hey, I don't care. Like I want them at home virtual and everything, but then we're going to have another set of students who are like, hey, they actually need to be in a classroom and everything. This may be attention span, like whatever it may be, you know, to kind of help them both and. Because we're seeing this just right now, there are still individuals who are still doing Zoom-based learning, but now, you know, individuals have also transitioned to the, back to the classroom. I don't think anything shifts one way heavily and everything, and everybody's kind of go to this and everything, because now you're back to a model that doesn't work for everybody and everything. And so I think it's both and. What's up? Yeah, because. Huh? Look at how far behind we are. You can go to examples. It's been, it's been an amplifying effect every generation because of different things that we didn't have two generations ago. Right? You look at the book. Right now, you, you, if you plug into the, the rich, the PCs, the, the tech pros, the people who were making some money. In, in digital, um, they're planning for this. So, like, we can't wait for the moment when we have a custom AI teacher for our kid. We're going to sit that kid in front of it and let the yeah. kid just learn. Elon Musk was talking about this three years ago. Yeah. And I can tell you, I see it already. When the kid has that attention, he does have that access to the trainings and the, the best of everything, they have so far advanced. It's not even a post to compare to what our kids are in public school. So now let's look at look at this five finger challenge down the line. Once this is once these kids are able to have these these types of lessons and be bathed in this education system, where does that put their kids? Mm. You know, education is it's not just money, education is even more important. You know, this is about amplifying education of the people who have way beyond anything we possibly imagine. What does this do? See why, so, see why I'm so excited about this? This, is, this starts conversations. It gets us thinking, talking, engaging. For me and him, building. Because now we have multiple different conversations and thought processes along the room. We almost, we almost forgot we we're talking about AI. <laughs> you know, and so think about, think about even just with this room. You know, ChatGPT, what we saw earlier, 18% of Americans have heard of ChatGPT. 
44% falls underneath the Asian and Indian community, 20% Hispanic, 17% white, 14% black, 18% Americans. It's obviously going to grow, but just think about what that does for this room and stuff alone. Now we have the ability to go home and say, hey, we're going to start this now. We're going to go back to the institution and say, hey, guys, have we started talking about X, Y, and Z? We need to start building this out. The county is here. Now we can start maybe doing at public tutoring sessions with the AI through their side. This changes everything. This is also, too, why it goes back into it's like this is, this is bigger than the farming industry, the industrial industry. This enhances thought process, engagement, creativity. Mm -hmm. Combining, hold on, we're quick. Combining these two and everything, personality, companionship, and everything. What does this do when you have an individual who now who's teaching finances? That's never been shifted. Now you have the ability to have an individual learn about finances in their own different way. In virtual reality, where they would have the illusion of being in a group of people with a group of people sitting in their room. Maybe that's how we're talking about. Five, ten minutes. It's an hour and fifty. real quick because we, we kind of forgot we still talking about this number up here. <laughs> now this is good and everything. Um, what's your name again? Uh, James. Jameson. Help me remember what the student you know, what, uh, what subject did we pick? Uh, this was, uh, History. History. Storytelling looks like. Uh, Comic book. Yep. The adventure of Tinky and Winky. This aligns with the level of four. Hold on. Go back up. Uh, level four, focus on analysis, synthesis, and evaluations. The Cone Book uses a blend of humor and encouragement to promote a positive learning environment and aligns inductive reasoning framework. How this Cone Book works. It's interesting. So it's, again, it's kind of like an outline. We just changed the prompt to kind of like get it to actually write the Cone Book. Timeline twist, a comic adventure through history. Character plot, oh, this is really nice. Covering the art style, we'll probably copy and paste some of this and put it in Mid Journey, Dolly 3. Oh, and there's also two, Dolly, Mid Journey, Dolly 3 is a text to image uh, a model. So you can give it a, an, um, a description of what you want. And they enter it in a prompt and it generates new images. 
the time travel tales, the journey through American history. That'll be interesting, especially in Florida. But again, this is just examples. And I, I built this in like, like four hours. I'm scaling this where it can be, you know, more creative, more focused. It's completely, completely, completely doable. Appreciate you. So closing out here, closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. Oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Overwhelming? I, I got more than I expected. Huh? Lots of like too much <laughs> If it's if it's overwhelming it's supposed to be. I mean I'm sorry? Can you go back to writing the front and make the thing? Oh yeah, for sure. But if it if it feels overwhelming, it's supposed to be. I mean as a software engineer. I, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> See, I'm overwhelmed. But I've also told myself some time ago, hey, Marlon, you're going to be overwhelmed. Get over it. This is just what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's open source, and there's so many different versions of Lama and SpaceX based on Jack and GPT. Uh, people taking it and creating different uh, models and crazy things with it. Now you have Falcon, which is even more powerful than mm -hmm. that. You know, you have all these models coming in next. Uh, I think one of the biggest ones is coming in Gemini. Mm -hmm. Um, good question. So the question is, with all the different large language models, and everything is being created by all, you know everything from big companies to you know open source communities and things like that. Um, how does one choose? I talked to some people at Hugging Face actually. Here, you can you can end it. Yeah, you can end it. <laughs>